It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this, the second lecture in our 2019 lecture series, and we appreciate your continuing support for this lecture series, even in its new venue. And I'm welcoming you to our Wall Garden Theater. It might be the first time for some persons. This is a, a labor of love, we could call it, that has finally come to fruition. We hate to pollute such things with commercial matters, but I, these things are not possible without generous sponsors, and I do want to acknowledge our sponsors, our own organization, the Museum and Historical Society, UWI's Department of History and Philosophy, the National Cultural Foundation, and in particular, a new sponsor this year, the Barbados Trailway Project. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. And he, he should know that I tend to be prophetic on these things, so I have a habit of calling him Sir Alan, and he should speak to the persons that have been calling that over the years and, and see what happens to them. So we have his extensive bio here, which I'm not going to bore you with. I would say I, I know him as one of the most decent and genuine persons at UWI. So it really gives me a distinct pleasure to introduce him to you. He is currently our Pro Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies, which means that in his day job, he keeps people like me honest, make sure that our programs are of high quality and maintain that UWI tradition of excellence. So in some ways, I kind of think of him as an administrator because he's been in that role for how many years now, Alan? Six years, seems like forever. But this lecture is reminded that, that he's first and foremost a scholar, and I didn't know this before, he's a graduate of University of Manchester, which is my alma mater, University of York, and the School for Oriental and African Studies, London. And he often reminds us that he's essentially, uh, he's at core a professor of South African history and comparative history. And he's here to speak to us on quite an interesting topic. As I said, he currently serves as the Pro Vice Chancellor for us both for undergraduate, which is quite a senior position within UWI. He's the author or editor of 11 books, as well as numerous articles and book chapters on aspects of South African and Caribbean history. And without further ado, I sort of want to invite Sir Alan to speak to us on the team from invitation to deportation, 70 years of the Winrush generation. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Justin, for those kind words. Um, the last time I heard somebody being knighted in advance, it was Sparrow knighting Sir Garfield Sobers 10 years in advance in a Calypso. If you had done it in a Calypso, it might have worked, but I, I'm not sure it will otherwise. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and especially in the Wall Garden, um, which is a beautiful venue. Um, and I'm very uh, happy and proud to have been asked to be part of this lecture series um, on the Windrush generation and their descendants. Now, um, in this lecture, I'm going to try and answer two broad questions. The first uh, is this. I want to consider what role watching and playing sport had in shaping the identity and consciousness of the Windrush generation and their descendants in Britain. In answering this question, it will consider, this lecture will consider chal the challenging, often hostile, racist environment West, Indi West Indians had faced in Britain uh, from 1948. It will consider the passionate support of the West Indies cricket team when it played in England during these years, and especially in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I'm also in this first, uh, in answering this first question, going to look at the role of numerous West Indian sports clubs that were established in Britain during this time. The second broad question concerns the role of British Caribbean sportsmen and women in British sports since the 1970s. 
and the instrumental role that sport has played in the lives of many young British Caribbeans growing up in Britain. Why was it that they achieved a prominence in British sport that was out of all proportion to the size of their community? What drove people of Caribbean descent to achieve such phenomenal success in fields such as boxing, athletics, and football? Now, this lecture will con conclude with a few thoughts about the complex relationship between sport and identity for Caribbean people both in Britain and the Caribbean since 1948. I want to begin with a couple of preliminary remar remarks. Firstly, there was a time when the study of sport was considered only in the context of teaching physical education. The famous French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu noted in an essay on the sociology of sport in 1988 that there was a sort of intellectual snobbery that prevented people from studying sport in a serious way. Fortunately, for the most part, that attitude no longer prevails today. The study of sport in all its aspects, psychological, sociological, political, economic, cultural, and historical, has blossomed over the last 30 years with the proliferation of academic research in various aspects of sport. And in fact, this important shift in understanding of sport in society was recognized formally by the UWI when it established a faculty of sport in 2018. This was the first new faculty, or 2017, sorry, the first new faculty established at the university in 40 years. Of course, one of the first to transcend the divide between the practice of sport and the study of sport was the great West Indian intellectual and cricket lover, C.L.R. James. His famous book, Beyond a Boundary, published in 1963, looked at the evolution of West Indian cricket culture in the context of the emergence of the movement to overthrow colonialism in the West Indies. And no lecture on sport and Caribbean identity could proceed without acknowledging a huge debt to CLR James at the outset. So I'm happy to do that now, and I'm going to return to CLR James in a little while. My second preliminary point is this. Who are we speaking about when we refer to the Windrush, Windrush generation and their descendants? Now, as you know, the MV Empire Windrush arrived in Tilbury on the Thames just outside London on the 21st of June, 1948, carrying 492 Caribbean migrants, and they dis disembarked the following day. The 22nd of June is now celebrated as Windrush Day uh, in England. The arrival of the Empire Windrush marked the formal beginning of a mass migration by people from the British colonies to the United Kingdom in the period after the Second World War. Of course, they were seeking work, but they were also seeking better lives for themselves and their families. The trigger for the influx of West Indians to Britain was the passing of the British Nationality Act in 1948, which gave citizenship to all people living in the UK and its colonies and gave them a right of entry and settlement in the UK. Geographer Seri Peach estimates that the number of people in Britain born in the West Indies grew from about 15,000 in 1951 to 172,000 in 1961. The unrestricted influx was partly stemmed by the passage of the Commonwealth Citizens Act of 1962 and then by the Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1968. It was finally ended by the Immigrants Act of 1971. However, the 1962 Act allowed the dependents of migrants to join their parents in Britain, leading to a significant influx of children from the West Indies into Britain uh, in that period. And in the period from 1962 to 1968, about 55,000 uh, West Indian children under 16 migrated to the UK. By the time the Act of 1971, the Immigrant Act of 1971 came into force, the number of migrants born in the West Indies who had settled in Britain had risen to 304,000. After that date, of course, while the number of West Indians living in the UK who had been born outside the country declined, the community of Caribbean descent continued to grow. By 1981, the population of West Indian descent in the UK was estimated to be at least 500,000. And in the census of 2001, 565,000 people categorized themselves as black Caribbean, 
or uh, about 1% of the total population of the UK. Um, incidentally, that same census in 2001 found that there were 21,601 Barbadian-born residents of the UK, uh, and they were the second largest uh, immigrant group from the Caribbean after the Jamaicans. So, when we think of the Windrush generation and their descendants, we are speaking of a community that grew from a few thousand in the late 1940s to over half a million by the beginning of the 21st century. And I want to turn to, and I hope this is working, ah, my first substantive question. What role did watching and playing sport have in shaping the identity and consciousness of the Windrush generation and their descendants in Britain? I want to focus in this first part of my lecture on the evolving relationship between West Indies cricket and British Caribbean identity. Now, of course, the first major cricket tour of England by the West Indies after the beginning of the Windrush migration was in 1950. Although the team was captained by a white Barbadian, John Goddard, the outstanding players were black, including, of course, the famous three Ws, Worrell, Walcott, and Weeks. During that tour, the West Indies won a famous victory in the second test at Lords, the home of English cricket. The game is remembered not only as a watershed in the history of West Indies cricket, the first time a West Indian, Indian team had defeated England on their home soil, it was also a watershed in the emergence of West Indian national identity. Oh, wrong way. In the crowd at Lords were thousands of the um, Windrush migrants who had recently arrived from the Caribbean. They cheered on their team and erupted into joyous celebration when they won. The London Evening Standard headline that night was a black day for English cricket. <laughs> but this is what the Times had to say, in part. That was the end, suitably acclaimed by a rush of West Indian supporters, one armed with an instrument of the guitar family. Lords will be a dull place indeed without these West Indian followers who maintained a loud commentary on every ball bowled during the match, and who, when it was over, were singing with delight, which rightfully belonged to them. Now, the person with the guitar was Lord Kitchener. And he recalled what happened on that day. I went there with a guitar, and we won the match. After we won the match, I took my guitar and I called a few West Indians and I went around the cricket field singing. And I had an answering chorus behind me. And we went around the field singing and dancing. That was a song that I made up. So while we were dancing, up come a policeman and arrested me. <laughs> and while he was taking me out of the field, the English people boo him. They say, leave him alone, let him enjoy himself. They won the match, let him enjoy himself. And he had to let me loose because he was embarrassed. So I took the crowd with me, singing and dancing from Lords into Piccadilly in the heart of London. And while we're singing and dancing and going to Piccadilly, the people opened their windows, wondering what was happening. I think it was the first time they'd ever seen such a thing in England. And we're dancing in Trinidad style, like mass and dance right down Piccadilly and dance around Eros. The policeman told me we are crazy. So we went a couple of times round Eros. And from there, we went to, to the Paramount, a place where they always had a lot of dancing. And we spend the afternoon there dancing and having a good time. Now I'm gonna pause here and ask for some technical help uh, to play uh, uh, the Calypso that was composed for that day. Cricket, lovely cricket. This calypso is uh, sometimes attributed to Lord Kitchener. And as you heard, he said that he composed a calypso extempo on the day to celebrate the victory. But the version we're going to hear was recorded by Lord Beginner. Um, and he is also attributed with the song. 
They were both at Lords that day, and they had both been part of that Windrush generation. So let's listen to Cricket, Lovely Cricket. Cricket, lovely cricket, at last where I saw it. Cricket, lovely cricket, at last where I saw it. Yardley tried his best, for that one detest. They gave the crowd plenty fun, the second test and West Indies won. With those little pals of mine, Was there well attire, so they started with Ray and Stolmeyer. Stolly was hitting balls wrong the boundary, but Waddle stopped him at 20. Ray had confidence, so he put up a strong defense. He saw the king was waiting to see, so he gave him a century with those little pals of mine. Posting in total was 326 just as usual. When Vesta bought Christiani, the whole thing collapsed quite easy. England then went on and made 151. West Indies then had 220 lead. God has said that is nice indeed. With those little pals of mine. wasn't broken hearted when the second inning started. Jenkins was like a target, getting the first five into his basket. But Gomez broke him down, while Walker flicked them around. He was not out for 168, leaving Yardley to contemplate. The bowling was super fine. Indies was feeling homely, their audience had them happy. When Washbrook century had ended, West Indies voices all blended. Hats went in the air, people shout and jump without fear. So, at Lord's was the scenery, it bound to go down in history. After all was said and done. I was sort of expecting you to join in the chorus there, but I didn't hear anybody singing. I think you can get a sense from this song of how important the victory was to Caribbean migrants who witnessed it. According to Colin Babb, many had arrived from the Caribbean with a strong sense of Britishness, imbued in them in their various colonial island homes, and with little sense of any collective West Indian identity. They had assumed that they would be accepted and welcomed with open arms as British when they arrived in the mother country. The reality, of course, proved to be quite different. Not only did they have to deal with the realization that they were far from home and separated from their families, they were shocked and traumatized by the unexpected hostility and abuse they faced in the streets and in their workplaces. It soon became clear that this hostility was fueled by a racism that was both commonplace and deeply rooted in British society at that time. Now, it's instructive that one of the Windrush migrants who was there at Lords that day, a man called Sam King, remembered the victory at Lords as a moment of validation for the migrants, as a result of which, he said, attitudes towards them begin, began to shift. So this is from Sam King. Now, after that, after the victory, the British people, realizing that the minority people from the colonies here had beaten them at cricket, we were not as stupid as a lot of them assumed or wanted us to be stupid. And even in the factories, gradually it started permeating that if you teach these people machinery, they will be good machinists. And then they realize if you give them the opportunity, they will be good non-commissioned officers. And if they had the education, they'll be officers. 
Yes, it was a milestone for the people from the colonies. So the reaction of the Caribbean migrants to victory against England at Lords in 1950 can be seen as the beginning of a collective response to the daily abuse and humiliation that they were facing in Britain. Through their support for West Indies cricket, many of the migrants from the various Caribbean territories met each other for the first time, and they recognized that they had a common identity and a common experience. They learnt what it was to be West Indian. It also gave them a vehicle to come together and to confront the racial realities of their new lives in Britain, not only to confront but to challenge them. West Indian nationalism, of course, had already emerged in the Caribbean territories as a powerful idea among the political and intellectual elite by this time. But it was the passionate support of the Windrush migrants beyond the boundary at Lords, Edgbaston, and the Oval that gave form and meaning to West Indian national identity for many working class West Indians in the 1950s, both at home and abroad. Of course, as you would expect, it was C.L.R. James who made this point most powerfully in his book, Beyond the Boundary. What do they know of cricket who only cricket know? Everybody knows that quote from James, but this is how it goes on. West Indians crowding to tests bring with them the whole past history and future hopes of the islands. English people, for example, have a conception of themselves breathed from birth. Drake and Mighty Nelson, Shakespeare, Waterloo, the charge of the Light Brigade, the few who did so much for so many, the success of parliamentary democracy, those and such are, are those as constitute a national tradition. Under developed countries have to go back centuries to rebuild one. We of the West Indies have none at all, none that we know of. To such people, the three W's, ram and vowel wrecking English batting, help to fill a huge gap in their consciousness and in their needs. By the time the, the next touring party from the West Indies arrived in England in 1957, the critical role played by West Indies cricket in the lives of West Indian immigrants was clear. The Times reported, the eighth West Indies cricket team to tour England arrived yesterday under skies which were a respectable imitation of their own blue, and to a boisterous and colorful reception. Since John Goddard brought his last team here seven years ago, their supporters have multiplied many times. Yesterday, the Calypsos began at Southampton in the morning, continued from a demonstrative crowd of 300 at Waterloo in the afternoon, and were still going strong in the evening outside the Kensington Hotel in which Goddard held his press conference. So, of course, in the interim, many more thousands of West Indians had arrived, and a momentum was building behind that sense of identity behind the West Indies team. The West Indies tours um, uh, continued, of course, the appointment of Frank Worrell and the, his first tour of Australia as the first black captain of the West Indies in 1960 was followed keenly by West Indians in Britain, as it was in the Caribbean, and only added to the passion with which they followed their team. West Indian tours of England in 1963, 1966, 1969, and 1973 were all followed with the same tremendous enthusiasm and pride by the Windrush generation. Clyde Walcott, an integral member of the team of the 1950s, recalled, in those days, colored people, or black people, whatever you want to call them, were more or less given a hard time. And they said how, and this was after the test, proud they felt to go into work or to school the next day, or the Monday, whatever it was, having beaten England. Similarly, West Hall, Wes Hall recalled being told by a supporter in England in the 1960s that many West Indians would rather stay home than go to work the day after the West Indies lost to England to avoid the humiliation and gloating comments of their co-workers. Another seminal moment in the history of West Indies cricket and of black British West Indian identity in the UK came during the West Indies tour of England in 1976. Before the first test match, the South African-born English captain, 
Tony Gregg was interviewed by the BBC. During the interview, Gregg said, you must remember that the West Indies, these guys, if they get on top, they are magnificent cricketers. But if they are down, they grovel. And I intend, with the help of Closey, meaning Brian Close, and a few others, to make them grovel. Now, Viv Richards was part of the visiting West Indies team. This is what he says. Suddenly, the news came on about the grovel remark. It simply stunned us. Someone told us that the word grovel was often used to put down the blacks in South Africa. Of course, Greg was a South African, so that only served to add fuel to our anger. His remark really worked wonders on us. We were so fired up, it was as if he had unintentionally handed us the ammunition we needed to win the series. The following day, Richards went out and scored 232 on the first day of the test. And the West Indies went on to win 3-0. The series had a galvanizing effect also on black support in England, where many second-generation black West Indians were beginning to feel alienated and discontented in Britain. This febrile us-against-them atmosphere surrounding the Test series was only magnified when the Soweto Rising erupted in South Africa on the eve of the second Test just a few days later. A single recorded by a Jamaican who went by the Sobicret, the man Ezike, entitled Who's Groveling Now, became the unofficial, unofficial anthem of the West Indies supporters during that tour. And of course, this was a riposte to Greg. The lyrics read in part, Who's groveling now? Who's groveling now? Greg, you're a loser somehow. If you had your way, we would, you would never let us play. So tell me, who is groveling now? I tried to find a recording of this. All I could find was a picture of the record, so I apologize. Um, I'm sure somebody has it somewhere and can donate it to the museum as an artifact. Now, during the late 70s and early 1980s, Viv Richards, with his inimitable and intimidating strut to the wicket, his aggressive power hitting and raster armbands, became the perfect iconic figure for an era in which alienated and angry black Caribbean youth, an increasing number of whom had been born in Britain, were seeking to assert their identity and claim their rightful place in British society. This picture, incidentally, is from the 1984 series when, as you can tell, uh, West Indies won 5-0, hence a blackwash. Another member of the West Indies team in this period was Gordon Greenwich, of Barbados, of course. He had been born in Barbados, but had spent most of his teenage years in England. Greenwich said that his hard-hitting batting technique was partly driven by anger. At times you felt, well, I think I would like to be back in the Caribbean rather than here. My anger came out in the way I played. I felt that to, to forcefully go at what I was doing, to attack, perhaps, was a way of letting out that anger. It wouldn't be right to do it to another human being, although you felt like it at times. So you just take it out on the ball. So there, the West Indies uh, team and West Indies cricket in the 70s and 80s is very much associated with, a, with that sense of black power and is projecting into the black community, the black Caribbean community, particularly amongst the younger uh, members, as a symbol of that black power uh, in a society that was still uh, very predominantly white and racist. Okay, so I want to turn from cricket now to look at West Indian sports clubs in Britain. Supporting West Indies cricket, of course, was one way to engender and consolidate West Indian identity among the Windrush generation. Another was the formation of West Indian sporting clubs. The first such club formed in 1948 was the Leeds Caribbean Cricket Club. Over the next three decades or so, similar clubs were formed in many towns and cities across the country, wherever Caribbean migrants were settled. According to its website, the Leeds Caribbean Cricket Club 
says it was created by the Jamaican Society in Leeds in 1948 as a social gathering for mainly West Indian men, although predominantly those from Jamaica. Since then, the club has expanded and evolved, inviting people from all ages and sex to take part in social and sporting activities. Um, among the semi-professional cricketers who played for the Leeds Caribbean Cricket Club were uh, Stuart Williams and Barbadian Corey Collimore, who went on to play for the West Indies. Um, the picture here is of the Preston Caribbean Cricket Club after they had won the, the local uh, cup competition in the Lancashire League. Somebody there knows these guys? Ah, yeah, oh, you're from Preston. Oh, I had a girlfriend in Preston once, but that's another story. Um, yes, we will, we will talk about that another time. Anyway, uh, this is the Preston Caribbean Cricket Club after they had won the Turner Cup six times in a row. This was the, the League Cup competition in Lancashire. And there they are being presented with the cup. Um, yeah, so um, another example, the Bristol West Indian Cricket Club, founded in 1963. It merged with another club called the Phoenix West Indian Club in 2013. Its website says, you will find within our history two and three generations of families that have been brought up in our club. This sense of community and family continues to be the backbone of who we are. Over the past 50 years, we have provided a significant place of focus in both the cricket and social environment, for not only the West Indian community, but also for the wider multicultural cultural community of Bristol. We have built up a club that offers a place of support, familiarity, and friendship, while at the same time being a place of high quality sporting endeavor and we have nurtured players who have gone on to represent England and the West Indies at international and county cricket level. Uh, one example of a player who came out of the, West Indies, uh, the Bristol West Indian Phoenix Cricket Club was David Sid Lawrence, um, who played for Gloucestershire and then for England briefly in the 1990s. Um, another club, the Sheffield Caribbean Cricket Club, uh, was the home club of Devon Malcolm, who went on to play as a fast bowler for England in the 90s. Especially during the years, let me come back in a minute, especially during the years of Caribbean migration, the sporting clubs not only provided opportunities to play cricket, they provided a haven where West Indians could socialize and enjoy a drink in police, play dominoes, and listen to West Indian music away from the potentially volatile and often racist working men's clubs and pub culture prevalent, prevalent, prevalent in England. Migrants from the same islands tended to settle in the same areas in England. For example, the Leeds Club was predominantly Jamaican, uh, while Barbadians were heavily represented in the Stevenage West Indies Sport and Social Club. They were very, uh, of course, Reading is the capital of Barbadians in, in England, as some of you may know. Uh, Leicester, uh, Leicester Caribbean Cricket Club had a significant Antiguan membership, having been founded in 1957 by two Antiguans, a Jamaican and a Guyanese. All of them, incidentally, had previously been in the RAF. New arrivals to the UK from the Caribbean often used the West Indian sports clubs as a base to find information about accommodation and job opportunities in the local area. One member of the, Sher uh, the Sheffield Caribbean Cricket Club remembered that the club provided other useful contacts. Within the cricket club, you'll have people with all sorts of skills. I knew a guy who was a mechanic who would fix my car. I had another guy who was an electrician. We'd all help each other, so the club played an important part. We'd lend each other money and things like that, so it wasn't only about cricket. Later, as the clubs developed in the 70s and 80s, they began to play each other in regular competition. From 1992 to 2007, several West Indian sports uh, cricket clubs contested the Victoria Mutual Caribbean Club. Uh, sorry, the Victoria Mutual Caribbean Cup. And sometimes, uh, particularly in the, in the 90s and uh, recently, they have organized sports trips home to the Caribbean. And in some cases, this was the first time that these migrants had come back to the Caribbean since leaving uh, 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years ago. Now, though the sports clubs formed a haven of sorts for Caribbean migrants of the Windrush generation, 
they could not entirely feel, uh, shield their membership from the racist environment around them. The Sheffield Caribbean Club, formed in the early 1970s, was blocked from membership of the local cr uh, cricket league for several years, allegedly because they did not own their own ground, although other teams were admitted that didn't meet that requirement. At the same time, a local league, as local league administrations appeared to be biased against West Indian and Asian clubs, the same clubs were being blamed by cricket administrators for opting out of mainstream competition. So, for example, the chairman of Yorkshire County Cricket Club in the 90s said uh, that the reason they hadn't signed a single Yorkshire or British-born black or Asian player was that they had all opted to play with themselves and didn't want to play with whites. And in fact, Yorkshire didn't have a, Br a British-born black or Asian player until 2003. The Sheffield Caribbean Cricket Club was finally admitted to its local league when it acquired its own ground. But this was not the end of the problems, as the club secretary explained. Within a week of getting ownership, we had an attack. We had all the glass smashed. Subsequently, subsequently we had the storeroom, the garage, and part of the pavilion burnt. Then we had the pavilion burnt down, which the police claim was the act of somebody passing by who put a firework in it. But the ground is way off the road. We subsequently had the pitch dug up and glass sprinkled across the pitch. We had to get a perimeter fence to try to exclude that. Similarly, the venerable Leeds Caribbean Cricket Club, the oldest of the West Indian cricket clubs, had its clubhouse vandalized, burgled, and burnt down during the 1980s and 1990s. On the latter occasion, it was also sprayed with racist graffiti. Now, the discrimination against the West Indian cricket clubs did not end at racist graffiti, barracking from opposition or administrative blocks. The sports sociologist Ben Carrington spent some time at the Leeds Caribbean Cricket Club in the late 1990s doing research. And he found that many of the umpires who officiated in these matches, quote, held stereotypical views about blacks, unquote. And this was exhibited in their general manner towards the black players, but also, as he says, in the disproportionate number of LBW decisions that they gave against the Caribbean cricket team. Okay, I'm moving on now to the rise of British Caribbean sportsmen and women. As we've seen, supporting West Indies cricket and joining West Indian sports clubs including the many cricket clubs, were important ways in which the Windrush generation supported each other and coped with the hostile environment they found in Britain. I'm turning now to my second substantive question, which concerns the emergence and remarkable prominence of British Caribbean sportsmen and women in Britain since the 1970s. And let me put this question in context for you with a few figures. I mentioned earlier that by 2001, just about 1% of Britain's population identified themselves as black Caribbean by birth or descent. In that year, 2001, about 15% of professional footballers in the English Football League had Caribbean heritage. 10 out of 23 of the English national football squad at the 200, uh, 2010 World Cup had ca Caribbean heritage. That's about just under 40%. At the Sydney Olympics held in 2000, 13 out of 18, or more than 60% of the athletes representing Britain in track and field had Caribbean heritage. In boxing, by 1990, 50% of British boxers were of Caribbean heritage. So these are very remarkable achievements for a small and embattled minority. How did they come to such a place of prominence and even dominance in British sport? The first point I want to make in responding to that question is that excellence in sport in Britain by Caribbean-born or descended people long predates the arrival of Empire Windrush in 1948. In fact, the first black man to play football in Britain on a semi-professional basis was a man called Andrew Watson, born in British Guyana in 1856. He was the son of a Scottish planter and a black woman. Watson was sent to school in England 
and he thereafter played football for clubs in England and Scotland in the 1870s and 1880s. And here's an amazing fact. The first black footballer who was from British, uh, 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 British Caribbean, from British Guyana, also was the first black man to captain the Scottish national team in 1881. And on that occasion, they beat England 6-1. By the way, I, I, I have no, as I say, I have no dog in this fight. Uh, both my parents are Scots, so I'm happy that the Scots won, uh, even though I was born in England. Um, yeah, so that's the example of Watson. Here's another example that I mentioned in a previous lecture a few months ago. This is Walter Tull, the son of a Barbadian carpenter and the grandson of a slave in Barbados. He was born of an English mother in Folkestone in 1888, and he was only the third black player to play professionally in the English First Division. He signed for Tottenham Hotspur in 1909 and later played for Northampton Town. He scored four goals for uh, Tottenham Hotspur in one season. When war broke out in 1914, Tull joined the army and he received a field commission as a second lieutenant in 1917. By the way, the, the, the uh, poster here is recruiting footballers to the football battalion in the First World War. So lots of professional footballers joined the football battalion, and Toll was one of them. So as I said, he received a field commission as a second lieutenant in 1917 on the Somme, and he thus became the first black officer in the history of the British Army. He was killed in action in March of 1918, and his body was never recovered. Another example, this time a female, Ethel Scott, uh, of a Jamaican father and an English mother, was the first black woman to represent Great Britain in an international athletics competition um, in the 1930s. She was a sprinter. And my final example is uh, the great Leary Constantine, the great West Indian cricketing pioneer and later leading social activist from Trinidad. He played 18 tests for the West Indies from 1928 to 1939, but he also played for Nelson Cricket Club in the Lancashire League for 10 years, from 1928 to 1938, and stayed on in England thereafter. Um, the plaque you can see um, was from his house in Kensington. Um, so he was uh, very close to the action uh, at Lord's and so on uh, in the same period that we're talking about today. Now, as these pioneers demonstrated, it was possible not only for black men and women to survive and make a living in sport in Britain, even in the 19th and early 20th century, but it was also possible for them to find success at the highest levels. The success of the predominantly black West Indies cricket team against the best players that England could assemble in 1950 and in subsequent test series was another dramatic demonstration of the power of sport. With sport, many things were possible. It was a great leveller. And this lesson was learnt and applied especially by the children of the Windrush generation and by their children after them. Now, individual motivations for success in sport varied, uh, as they do among many people, but they also varied amongst people of British Caribbean descent. But there were some similarities amongst many of them. Let's take the case of boxer Morris Hope. As you can see there, he won the British Junior Middleweight title, the British Commonwealth Junior Middleweight title, European Junior Middleweight title, and was WC light middleweight champion from 1979 to 1981. For Hope, it was his personal experience of racism that was the spur to greatness. He was born in St. John's, Antigua in 1951. And he goes on to say, I came to England when I was nine. That would have been in 1961. And that's when I saw the world for what it's all about. I was still a child, but I saw it, the black and white thing. It was a reality. Not that it came to me just thinking. I realized it at school. From the age of, say, 11, I began to see that I'm black and the others were white, and there was no use putting it behind me. So around that time, uh, 11 or 12, he took up boxing. The club he attended in, was in the East End. And while there, he was called a black bastard, he was spat on, and he was pushed out of the showers. As he recalled, 
This shocked me, because I'd left Antigua with no idea what colour prejudice was. He went on, You can imagine how frustrated I felt. I'm only human. Outside the ring, you feel frustrated, but you can try to argue and get some facts. But that's the most you can do outside the ring. You argue with one another and put it down to the fact that people who are prejudiced are ignorant. It makes no sense arguing with them, so I had to walk away or get involved in fights. Most of the time, I'd walk away. Now, in the ring, it's different. It's all legal there. <laughs> so for Morris Hope, boxing was a cathartic experience. The sport allowed him to express his anger and to channel his aggression. Uh, sociologist Ernie Cashmore argues that ultimately this attitude also made Morris Hope a champion because it hardened him. As a black man, he was determined to fight longer and harder than any of his opponents. Before defending his world, world title in 1980, Hope said, people like myself and the footballers and athletes, we're black and have been pressed down, okay? But they can't keep us down forever because we're going to show whites that we're better than them at their own game. We've made it and we're showing other blacks that they can make it as well. Other British Caribbean boxers who excelled in these years and who became world champions include Lloyd Hunnigan, born in Jamaica, who held the world weight, welterweight title from 1986 to 1989. Frank Bruno, whose mother was a Pentecostal lay preacher from Jamaica, who became Britain's first world heavyweight boxing champion in almost a century in 1995. He was followed by Lennox Lewis, British born of Jamaican parents, who defeated Evander Holofield and Mike Tyson to become the world's leading heavyweight in the late 90s. And in the middleweight division, there was Chris Eubank, who had grown up in Jamaica, and Nigel Benn, of course, of Barbadian descent. They both claimed world titles in the early 1990s. Now, if personal experience of racism was one spur to sporting fame for the children of the Windrush generation, Another was the related experience of discrimination against them in the schools they attended in Britain. The parents of the Windrush generation, like most Caribbean parents, had a strong commitment to education as a means to uplift their children from poverty. Despite this, most British Caribbean children struggled in the British school system, where the expectations of black students among their mostly white teachers was very low, and where scant attention was paid to any learning difficulties they might have in this new and strange environment. Many children of Caribbean migrants reported that the teachers scarcely bothered to teach them, but instead encouraged them to participate in sport. Now, in fact, this was the experience of our own Hilary Beckles. Now, of course, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, who found himself treated as educationally slow when he went to live with his parents in Birmingham at the end of the 1960s. And you can see how that turned out. <laughs> as late as 1980, the Association of Head Teachers in England argued in a submission to a government commission that the best hope for success of West Indian children in school was not in academic subjects, but in, quote, their natural sense of rhythm, color, and athletic prowess, unquote. However, going back to sociologist and social historian Ernie Cashmore, he has no patience with this kind of racist thinking. He observed in 1982 that many British Caribbean children who were branded as slow, as having bad attitudes, or being inca incapable of learning in school, demonstrated the exact opposite in a sporting context. They were highly motivated, he said, prepared to learn, willing to comply with demands, eager to listen, Perhaps they didn't want to follow the rules, but they did. Those who went on to notable success in sport in Britain, he argued, did so through their commitment, hard work, and determination to, con to constantly challenge themselves and to succeed in the face of the potentially debilitating racist environment. And in fact, in a somewhat similar argument, Hilary Beckles argues 
that the success of West Indies cricket from the mid-70s to the early 1990s was not built, as racists argue, on a fortuitous combination of talent and happy-go-lucky calypso cricket, assisted by an unfair advantage in fast bowling. It was born out of what he calls a carefully nurtured culture of commitment, hard work, and professionalism which was motivated by a powerful sense of national purpose and pride. And this was why no other cricketing country could hope to match the West Indies winning combination. Now, in addition to encountering racism and a different, difficult school environment, many children of the Windrush generation had challenges at home. Take, for example, the experience of Wilf Slack. And Wilf Slack is there on the left. He went on to, uh, uh, Wilf Slack uh, represented England cr in cricket briefly in the 1980s. He was born in Trumaca, a small village on the leeward side of St. Vincent, on the 12th of December 1954. But he left to join his parents in England, aged 12, in December 1966, accompanied by his younger sister. Wilf said, that their excitement at moving to England quickly evaporated. They were greeted by cold, unwelcoming weather before being introduced to their new family who had settled in High Wycombe. Phyllis, Will's sister, in particular, only had vague memories of their parents and knew them mainly through photographs, as she did her younger brothers, Jeff and William, whom neither she nor Wilf had met. Like many children brought over from the West Indies during the 1960s, they struggled to adapt to their new surroundings. So for many of those young uh, people who came over, particularly in the 1960s to the UK, to join their parents who had been working there for five or 10 years, whatever it was, there was a very difficult family situation. They barely knew these parents um, and had to get to know them as well as the strange environment they were working in to deal with the challenges at school and so on. So if this family situation for Wilf uh, was difficult, for Wilf and Phyllis was difficult, they found some res respite at school by excelling at sport. However, this success was not appreciated by their parents, who were upset that they were neglecting their studies. So in his early life, Wilf and his sister Phyllis had many arguments with their parents over the fact that they were giving their time to sport when they should have been studying. In this case, and in common with many children of the Windrush generation, success in sport came despite, not because, of their parents' uh, support. Now, apart from Will Slack, 10 other players born in the Caribbean or of Caribbean descent uh, played cricket for England between 1980 and 1995. Of course, the pioneer was Roland Butcher, who you see here on on my, on my left, your right. Roland Butcher was born in St. Philip, Barbados in 1953, and he migrated to England to join his parents at the age of 13. He represented Middlesex in the English County Championship from 1974 to 1990, and he played three tests and three one-day internationals for England, beginning in Bridgetown in 1981. The player in the middle there is Norman Cowens. So these three, Will Slack, Norman Cowens, and Roland Butcher were the first three black players of uh, Caribbean heritage to play for England. Um, incidentally, um, apparently Will Slack um, was a very religious man, a very quiet and uh, religious man, and would always go, when he was on tour with the England team, he would go to church regularly. So uh, Ian Botham, who toured with him, uh, gave him the nickname Bishop Tutu. Uh, yes, yeah. so the others, apart from uh, those three, uh, the others who played for England in that period, 1980-95, Gladstone Small, of course, born in Barbados in 1961, Neil Williams, Devon Malcolm, Sid Lawrence, Philip De Freitas, Chris Lewis, Joey Benjamin, and Mark Rampakash. Between 1995 and 2010, only four more Afro-Caribbeans made their um, debuts for England. They were Mark Butcher, Dean Headley, Alex Tudor, again of Barbadian parentage, 
and Mark Carberry of Guyanese Barbadian parentage. Um, unfortunately, as the West Indies know to their cost, in the recent British to uh, the English tour, uh, another Barbadian-born player, Chris Jordan, featured and uh, unfortunately destroyed some of the, bar uh, the West Indies batting. Um, Um, oh, by the way, at this time in Middlesex, you see there the, the three who played for England, but there were five black players, players for Middlesex in 1980. And uh, they were called, inevitably, the Jackson Five, because they were the five black players in the team. Now, despite the elevation of British Caribbean players to the national team, this did not mean that they were immune from racist attacks or assumptions. In 1995, Wisden Cricket Monthly published a special issue on race and national identity, which featured an article entitled, quote, Is It in the Blood? Unquote. The article questioned the loyalty and attitude of Asian and black British players, and it argued that blacks and Asians, wherever born and raised, could never be culturally English and could never feel, quote, a deep, unquestioning commitment to England, unquote. Now, what I haven't reproduced from the article, but this is a comment from the editor of Wisden Cricket Monthly, David Frith, who published the article. He wrote to the author of the article, let me just assure you that I was one of the earliest to feel a sense of unease at the number of foreign players piling into the England 11. The principle seems wrong, and I think that there has been some sort of dislocation in the national psyche. How can a true Englishman ever see this as his representative side, despite all the chat about the commitment of the immigrant. Now, in response to that, Devon Malcolm, Philip de Freitas, and Chris Lewis, all British Caribbeans who were playing for England at the time, sued the uh, journal for defamation. And the England captain, Mike Atherton, at the time, resigned from the editorial board of Wisden Cricket Monthly uh, in protest. Um, how am I doing? Um, one little aside here. What we're talking about here is that notion of parallel loyalties. Um, and of course, this was in the context in 1990-91 that Norman Tebbit talked about the cricket test. The idea that you could tell whether somebody was really British or really English if they, for example, uh, an Indian immigrant, if he went to Lords and cheered India instead of England, then they weren't really British. And that applied, of course, for the West Indians. If they cheered the West Indies instead of England, despite being born and grown up in England, they weren't really English. Now, there was a, a flip side to that. Um, I mentioned that Gordon Greenwich had left Barbados as a teenager and had spent his teenage years learning cricket and going to school in England. He then became a member of the West Indies team. He was invited back to play for Barbados in the 1970s, in the mid-late 1970s. But he was shocked and dismayed to be barracked and booed every time he took the field. People shouted at him, Englishman, go home. And he, he was, he, he, commenting on it, he said, he couldn't understand why his own people were treating him this way. And it was, it was explained to him later that it was because he had taken the place of a local favorite who would otherwise have played. So he wasn't looked on as a real Barbadian. Now, and I actually, when I came to Barbados, I'm going off the track here, I apologize. I'll try and get back on in a minute. When I came back, uh, when I first came to Barbados, I stayed um, in a house, I was in the upstairs flat, my landlord was downstairs, a wonderful man called Frank Crookendale. But he had been part of the Windrush generation. He had worked as a driver for the police in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, came back to Barbados in the 1980s. And for the rest of his life, his family referred to him as the Englishman. I remember him telling me that very wryly on one occasion that they don't believe he's Barbadian anymore. And he says, well, it's true, because I can't stand to wait in lines, I can't understand why people don't come on time, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, 
having had the English experience, he found it hard to, to get back into, into Barbados. But he wasn't given uh, an unequivocal welcome, let's put it the other way. Um, you could also make the point about, if you think about the Barbados football team, people like Emerson Boyce, who born in England, of Barbadian parentage, came back to play for Barbados. The reggae boys, when they were flying high in the 1990s, many of that team were English-born of Jamaican parentage, and they were brought back to play for Jamaica. And there was some debate at the time about whether that was an appropriate thing to do. So just as these issues were being debated in the Caribbean, they were also being debated in England about the true loyalties, if you like, of British Caribbean people. Now, of course, the children of the Windrush generation also excelled in athletics, as they had in boxing and cricket. Sprinter Linford Christie, born in Jamaica, won 23 major championship medals, more than any, any other British ma male athlete has done um, to date. And this included the gold medal in the 100 meters at the 90, 1992 Barcelona Olympics. Hurdler Colin Jackson of Welsh and J Jamaican heritage held the 110 meters hurdles world record for 11 straight years between 1993 and 2004. Jamaican-born javel javelin thrower Tessa Sanderson became the first British Caribbean woman to win gold at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. And Denise Lewis, also of Jamaican heritage, won heptathlon, heptathlon gold in the 2010 Sydney Olympics. In 2004, Kelly Holmes, the daughter of a Jamaican-born car mechanic, took gold in both the 800 and 1500 meters in Athens. Now, the last sport I want to look at is football. I mentioned earlier that by 2011, around 15% of players in the English Football League were of British Caribbean descent. This included several who were applying their trade in the Premier League. However, if you rewind back to the 1960s and 1970s, watching and even playing football had quite limited appeal to the Windrush generation and their children who were still mainly interested in cricket. As Colin Babb notes, in those days, attending English international football fixtures at Wembley and domestic fixtures, fixtures across the country was often a hazardous experience for black Caribbean supporters. There was the daunting prospect of fending off personal abuse from a vocal minority of football supporters and of watching black players being racially abused by sections of the crowd. Additionally, at some matches, extreme far-right nationalist political organizations, including the National Front, openly attempted to recruit white football fans on the terraces or outside the stadiums. The first black Caribbean player of Caribbean descent to, to play for England was Viv Anderson, who was called up in 1978. He admitted that he did not take his role models from the English team. Growing up, he said, I always followed Brazil to see people like myself playing the game. Now here's a personal anecdote. The first black player I ever saw playing football in England was Clyde Best, who was from Bermuda. He was playing for West Ham when they were drawn against my non-league team, Hereford United, in the fourth round of the FA Cup in February of 1972. I was 12 and I sat on a beer crate behind the goal at the Eggers Street ground to watch the game. It was also the first time I heard a racist chant at a football match. At that time, uh, Cadbury's Chocolate had an advert for their whole nut chocolate bars, which were set to a calypso rhythm and went, hazelnuts, hazelnuts, Cadbury's took them and they cover them with chocolate. Whenever Clyde Best touched the ball, he was greeted with a chorus of this same song. But of course, with the words hazelnuts replaced by Clyde Best. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, West Brom featured three black British Caribbean players, seen here. And their manager, Ron Atkinson, called them the three degrees. Cyril Regis, you see on which order have I got them in? 
Laurie Cunningham, Cyril Regis, Brendan Batson. Cyril Regis was from French Guiana. Laurie Cunningham uh, from, uh, of Jamaican parentage. And Brendan Batson, born in Grenada. Um, incidentally, Laurie Cunningham was the first English player to play for Real Madrid. Um, and he died of a, in a car crash at the age of 33 in Madrid. Um, every week, the three, player, the three black players ran a gauntlet of abuse, spittle, and bananas thrown from opposing fans. Cyril Regis, who was the third black player to play for England, uh, after Viv Anderson and Laurie Cunningham, recalled, we used to get letters all the time, you know. When I was called up for England for the first time, there was a letter, an anonymous letter saying, if you go to Wembley and put on an English shirt, you'll get one of these through your knees. There was a bullet in the envelope. And in fact, Cyril Regis, Regis kept the bullet for the rest of his life and would show it regularly when he spoke. A Roland Butcher was a contemporary and later a friend of Cyril Regis. He remembered his importance as a role model. This is Roland, Roland Butcher speaking now. As a young black man growing up in England in the 1970s, you would watch players like Cyril and really look up to him. They showed a generation of young black kids what was possible. To see them break into a difficult game like football was incredible. Those guys had to put up with a huge amount. It was almost always rougher for the footballers than it was for the cricketers. Football in England is so tribal, those guys would really run the gauntlet. They had to be very strong people. Cricket attracts a very different audience, an older audience generally. So although we would get the odd remark, it was nothing compared to the kind of hostility that Cyril had to put up with. Players like Cyril and Laurie were icons for black kids in the inner cities everywhere, myself included. Another example, in 1984, when the Jamaican-born forward John Barnes scored for England against Brazil in Rio, some England fans who had been subjecting him to racist chants throughout the game refused to cheer when he scored because he was a black man. Black footballers not only faced abuse from the terraces, they had to contend with the racist attitudes of other players and of coaches and managers, who often complained that black players were lazy and got on by talent rather than intellect. For example, Jim Smith, then manager of Queen's Park Rangers, told a reporter in 1987, quote, black players use very little intelligence. They get on by sheer ability, unquote. In the 1970s and 1980s, some argued that West Indians made good forwards because they were speedy and they could use their athleticism, but they did not have the character or intelligence to play defense or central midfield. The result was that black footballers in the 1970s and 80s were underrepresented in central positions, requiring constant interaction and coordination with other players, and overrepresented in non-central positions such as wingers. And uh, in the United States, this was a practice that the academics called stacking. Uh, let me give the, the US example, then I'll come to the British example. In the US, uh, there was a virtual absence of black quarterbacks in the NFL until the 1980s. And this was because it was argued that black people couldn't deal with the complicated job of being a quarterback. All of that changed when Warren Moon broke the uh, broke through in the 1980s and became the first black franchise quarterback. He was also the first black quarterback elected to the NFL Hall of Fame in, uh, in 2006. Now let me show you how this worked in English football, this idea of stacking. Here you have the percentage of Afro-Caribbean players in the English Football League um, in 1985 and 1989 90. You will see by division, division one, in 1985, six, 9.8%, 1989, 15.4%, and so on. So you can see that Afro-Caribbean players were most represented in the top divisions, and as you went down the divisions, there were fewer. But one good thing that you can see in this table is that uh, across the board, they were becoming more prominent throughout this period, throughout the 1980s. And as I said, remember that we're talking about a time when barely 1% of the population of Britain 
is uh, Afro-Caribbean. Oh, wrong way. Okay, now here we have uh, the same period, 1985-1986, by position. You will see in 1985-6 there were 130 goalkeepers, 131 goalkeepers, only one was Afro-Caribbean. There were 249 fullbacks, only 22 were Caribbean. There were 238 centre backs, only 14 were Caribbean. There were 354 midfielders, only 17 were Caribbean. But then you come to the forwards, out of 360, uh, 363 white forwards, 57 Afro Caribbean forwards. So this is the idea of stacking. Because of that racist assumption about the abilities of black footballers, they were disproportionately identified as forwards and were not given other roles. Now, let's go forward to 1990. Whoops, forward. Same numbers here, but this time you'll see no black goalkeepers, but there are more black fullbacks, more black centre backs, more black midfielders. So there's a slight shift as those as uh, black players began to prove themselves in those other positions. Um, although still the predominance was forwards. The other thing to note here is in that year um, of 1,454 total players in the English Football League, 86 were Afro-Caribbean, or 21%, which is a remarkable number. Now, fortunately, attitudes have moved on apace in Britain, in British football, since the 1980s. Um, Paul Ince, you can see here, the son of Barbadian parents born in England in 1967, became the first black player to captain England in 1992. Another son of a Barbadian father, Ashley Cole, born in 1980, had 107 caps for England uh, between 2000 and 2014. By the way, um, his father's name was Calendar. He was a calendar, but he left, he left his mother, uh, the, the, the baby and the mother, very young. And so Ashley took his mother's name, not his father's name. Fast forward to 2019, and we find that seven of the 23 players in the English national team for the opening Euro 2020 football match last Friday had British Caribbean heritage. Kyle Walker, Danny Rose, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Callum Wilson, Jaden Sancho, Marcus Rashford, and Raheem Sterling. And many others have featured in England games recently. Ashley Young, Jesse Lingard, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Theo Walcott, Fabian Delph, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, and Chris Smalling. Racism in football is still an issue. And one of the things that happened on Friday when England played is that there was a great deal of racist abuse in Kazakhstan, is it Kazakhstan, wherever they were playing, uh, Montenegro, against the black players. And one of the ones who made a stand against it, as you might expect, was Raheem Sterling, who, when he scored the fifth goal for England, then cupped his ears to the fans who were shouting insults at him. But even in England, for many years, as some of you will know, Raheem Sterling was plagued by negative headlines because he was too flash, because he showed off. Uh, he got criticized for buying his mother a house. It was rumored he had a golden toilet, all of these kinds of things. But it was all about putting him down. And Sterling has emerged out of all of that and become one of the leading players for England today. So, you'll be glad to hear I come to my conclusion. As we have seen during the course of this lecture, a common West Indian identity was forged by the Windrush migrants in the 1950s as a defense against the racist climate they accounted in Britain. It was shaped and expressed firstly in their support for the West Indies cricket team, and then through the formation of numerous West Indian sporting and social clubs. Participation in sport also became a vital route to self-actualization for many children of the Windrush generation who challenged and rejected negative stereotypes of blackness through the pursuit of success in sport. Now, one notable effect of the major, major opening up of opportunities for black players in English football since 1990 is that the latest generation of British Caribbean descent 
have rather little interest in West Indies cricket, but they generally support the England, the England national football team. And that's quite a change from 20, 30 years ago. Underlying this shift has been a number of factors, not the least of which is demographic change. According to one survey in 1998, more than half of the people of British Caribbean descent living in the UK were in inter-ethnic relationships, indicating, of course, that they were being increasingly absorbed into a common multi-ethnic British identity and consciousness. For example, if you look up the Young England and Manchester United forward Marcus Rashford on the internet, if you look for his online profile, you will find it says he is of Catitian descent. He's from his heritage is St. Kitts and Nevis, but his ethnicity is English. And you could not imagine a child of the Windrush generation 30 or 40 or 50 years ago being described as ethnically English. That is a remarkable shift. This reclamation of a sense of Britishness by the current generation, of course, has very little in common with that evinced by the Windrush generation at the time of their arrival in Britain 70 years ago. When the Windrush migrants stepped off the boat in Tilbury, they thought of themselves British because that was part of the ethos of colonialism. By contrast, the British identity of the children of Windrush, the identity that they now claim as their own birthright, is the product of four generations of struggle and negotiation in Britain. And it is sport, above all, as I hope I have shown, that has played a critical role in that process. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. I, I think he deserves another round of applause. <laughs> so we are now going to open up for a, a brief Q&A session. So we invite you, if you have a question, to approach the microphone. And we like persons to ask a question, not give a second lecture. So, we, so, 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 so let's observe that discipline. <laughs> Good night. From our social media, Bill H. wants to say, great presentation, thank you. Not sure if Eddie Paris got a mention. He was the son of a Barbadian who fought in World War I. He became the first black player to play football for Wales in 1930s. So just wanted to... I didn't mention him, but you're right. Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, so we now have a lot of questions. So again, we want to thank Alan and show appreciation. Yeah, so I don't know about you, but I rather enjoyed that. I thought it was quite an appropriate lecture. He did an excellent job, as we would expect. So our next lecture, which will be held next week, is titled Stand Firm in England, Art and Migration in the Anglophone Caribbean World by Dr. Alison Thompson. So we, I want to invite you to come out and support that lecture as well. I also want to invite you to take part in a small project we have that if you have any migration experience or stories that you may contact with our assistant curator for social history, Natalie Maguire. She's available on the lecture evenings from 4 p.m. or you can contact us and make an appointment with her for other times so that you can share your migration experience with us. I also want to invite you to, if possible, make a donation to the work of the Museum of Historical Society. Your donation will assist us in carrying out our work. So again, I want to thank you, wish you a good evening, and invite you to some liquid refreshment on the outside. Thank you. Have a good evening.